It is, of course, a great pleasure to be here, to be here today to address um, an issue of critical importance, namely the, um, the role, the crucial, the central role of the regions and cities you represent in delivering growth, in delivering a, an inclusive growth, a job-rich growth for Europe. And of course, what uh, other place in the whole of Europe could have been more appropriate to speak about the future of Europe, about our future, than here, Athens, the leading city of ancient Greece, which, as a city, led the foundations of democracy and our common Western civilization. Now, of course, 2014, Athens, like the whole of Europe, is looking for a pathway forward to restore this solid, sustainable growth we all need. Ladies and gentlemen, before entering into the subject, I would, of course, like to thank the region of Attica and also the Committee of the Regions of the European Union for hosting this important and timely event and for having us here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's fair to say that the um, path to, from crisis to recovery has already been long. Compared to other parts of the globe, very long indeed, with as many unexpected deviations, temptations, and turning points as Odysseus has encountered on his home way to Attica. But unlike Odysseus, we cannot afford to spend the whole of a decade finding our way. Indeed, six years after the onset of the crisis, if we do not move quickly as policymakers in Europe, we really risk lose risk losing an entire generation of young people while blighting the lives of older cohorts. And of course, the effects of this disaster would be felt for decades to come. To be honest, ladies and gentlemen, as you know it just as we do, many of our citizens already doubt of our ability, your ability, our ability altogether, ability of the governments, ability of the parliaments, ability of the international institutions, to deliver. Indeed, one of the most unfortunate, and which importance is still underestimated, most important legacies of the crisis is the so-called erosion of the public trust in our governments. According to our government at glance, and this is one of the reports which is at your disposal here today, well, according to that study, the confidence in national governments in our member states, the 34 OECD countries from Chile to South Korea and from Canada to New Zealand, well, this trust, this confidence in national governments of OECD countries has fallen to a record low of 40% only with even more important declines in country hit hardest by the crisis like Ireland, like Spain, like Italy, and for instance, of course, also Greece. So restoring trust, restoring trust of the people in the ability of governments to deliver services and to ensure access to employment and economic opportunities for citizens in all parts of the national territory, restoring that trust is really a key basic element in all kinds of sustainable growth strategies. And a big part of this task depends on regions and cities' governments who have, of course, a more direct interaction with citizens and until now, more credibility, more confidence, more trust by the people. Ladies and gentlemen, more than five years already since the onset of the crisis, the onset of the global and very important financial crisis, economic recovery remains fragile throughout the whole of our constituency, which is the most industrialized countries in the world. We are indeed, for instance, still very preoccupied by unemployment and in particular by high levels, as you know, of youth unemployment. And this is often highly concentrated in space, in space as shown by our region at glance. The second study I would like to recommend to you, which is also available here. And this study shows that in at least 10 OECD countries, not only in the Eurozone, not only in the European Union, but at least in 10 OECD countries, more than 40% of the increase in unemployment in recent years occurred very concentrated in one or two regions, part of these countries. 
which underlines that regional policy, addressing on a tailor-made basis the challenges in particular regions is of utmost importance. Re ladies and gentlemen, the crisis has of course exacerbated social as well as territorial inequalities within countries. Indeed, the gap in GDP per capita between leading and lagging regions has increased in half of OECD countries since 2008. So we have a rise in inequalities. And where regional disparities were reduced, this owed more to the decline of the richest regions than to the catching up by the poorest. Secondly, a higher level of uh, regional income inequality reflects higher levels of interpersonal inequality. And of course, as you know, regional inequalities go far beyond GDP, affecting different outcomes that shape well-being, including, for instance, education and health. To take a non-European example, life expectancy in Mississippi, for instance, is four years lower than the average American. Or to take a European country, in the field of education, in France, the share of the workforce with only basic education. So the part of the people that only have a basic education in France is almost 20 percentage points higher in Corsica than in Brittany. So more than a difference between member states, for instance, in, of the European Union, there is within the different member states an enormous difference in terms of development, and there is a drag on social cohesion. Indeed, many of our economic, social, and environmental challenges cannot be solved unless we see that reality and unless we get cities and regions right. Variations in performance, variations also in underlining conditions which are important to that performance are often greater within countries than across countries, a fact which underscores the limits of the one-size-fits-all economy-wide policies for generating sustainable, inclusive growth in the current economic environment. And if I can put a critical approach to what the European Union is doing in terms of monitoring the economic policy of the member states of the Eurozone, for instance, well, it would be on that level. Indeed, there is too much of a one-size-fits-all approach to the national policies in terms of monitoring the economic policies within the Eurozone, for instance. So a more differentiated approach reflecting in a better way specificities of OECD regions offers, of course, a better way, a more efficient, a more effective way of tackling the growth, employment, and environmental challenges we face in the difficult years ahead. But a crucial question, of course, is how can we foster inclusive and sustainable job-rich growth? We can, amongst others, we can achieve it through better policies and through better spending. To start with the latter, for instance, OECD countries spent about, in US dollars, 1.2 trillion in public investment in 2012. As you know, about two-thirds of this public investment, investment by public authorities, was carried out by regional and city governments. So when used wisely, in the right way, this of course represents one of the most growth-enhancing forms of public expenditure. However, and of course in order to sustain spending on welfare, health and education, which in many cases was pushed upwards by the crisis, we see that subnational governments cut investment, which for instance contracted by 13% in the year 2009. And the fall, and that's all over the place, that's all over the globe, that's all over the OECD constituency, the fall in subnational public investment was even bigger in the European Union, where it exceeded, where the fall exceeded 20% over the three years from 2010 to 2012. So in short, subnational governments faced with limited scope for controlling other forms of spending treated investment as an adjustment variable. At the same time, as we know, besides the contraction of public expenditure, investment expenditure, private investment also contracted. Although often public and private investment tend to move in opposite directions, public investment usually picks up as the economy slows, as governments want to try to boost growth. And that is what happened at the beginning of the crisis. In the fiscal years 2009-2010, since then, however, 
both components of the investment, especially in the Eurozone, the public part and the private part have been depressed, and it looks as if uh, fiscal constraints will remain for the couple of next years. So that means that uh, it is more important than ever for governments to learn to do better with less. And we are trying to develop at the OECD an instrument which aims to help governments to do just that, so to increase the efficiency with which public investment is managed across levels of government. And good practices in this domain can indeed, in an efficient way, with less money, reduce inequalities, rebuild trust, help to restore growth, and enhance well-being. Ladies and gentlemen, the proposed OECD principles on, and I quote, effective public investment across levels of government, in the multi-level government, aim to respond more broadly to what I would call three systemic challenges that all governments face, whatever the institutional context. Challenges in coordination, challenges in capacity, and challenges in framework conditions. To start with the first, challenges in coordination. Various types of coordination challenges across the different actors involved in public investment. Indeed, we need to coordinate in order to uh, strengthen the efficiency, coordinate across policy sectors at all levels of government. At least, and at best, we need to avoid working at cross-purpose areas, which is, of course, a waste of resources. And ideally, spending across sectors should be mutually reinforcing to get, as the Americans say, more bang for the buck or more value for money. Investment in transport infrastructure, for instance, which is much needed in lots of parts of the European Union that play a very important logistic role. Well, investment in transport infrastructure needs to be integrated with national and regional development, economic development priorities, what of course will help us to avoid systems like uh, bridges to nowhere and so on. We need also greater coordination, not only across policy sectors at all levels of government, but also between national and subnational governments. This is no small feat, but it is critical. It is critical because most of the public investment, the bigger part of this 1.2 US dollars a year, most of public investment involves indeed a mix of funding from different levels of government. And so the better these levels of government work together on dossiers, the more coherent and efficient these investments are likely to be. But such coordination is easier to affirm, is easier to talk about than to realize in practice. There are, after all, approximately over 141,000 general purpose regional and local governments in our constitu constituency in the OECD, 141,000 general purpose regional and local governments. To that, we may add that thousands more special purpose governments also exist, like school districts, water boards, transport authority, and so on. So we really need better tools, develop better tools, to help align investments across levels of government. That is, last but not least, also a need for better coordination in a more horizontal way. Horizontal way coordination across municipalities. Intermunicipal collaboration can serve to achieve sufficient scale for investment, improve investment returns, avoid duplicative investments, and adapt investments to the need of regional economy. So the first challenge is more better organized coordination. The second challenge to render this very important amount of investment more efficient in terms of organizing the conditions for sustainable job reach growth is the question of the capacity challenges. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, public investment and growth outcomes are correlated to the quality of government, including at the subnational level. So where the capacities to design and to implement investment strategies are weak, policies are likely to fail to achieve their objectives. So the quality of our regional and local governments has to be reinforced through capacity building efforts that may help improve the returns to public investment, such as effective strategic planning, a rigorous ex ante appraisal, competitive procurement, or sound monitoring systems. The initiative in the United States, for instance, the so-called Strong Cities, Strong Communities initiative in the United States, 
brings together multiple federal entities who work directly with cities, staffs with city staffs, to develop and implement their economic strategies, enabling them to cut through the red tape and to facilitate access to federal support, to cut through the red, red tape in a real efficient way with results, and to facilitate access to federal support. This kind of effort paid in the US could be a good example to help some regions in the European Union, for instance, to address the red tape challenges posed by the structural funds. Ladies and gentlemen, besides the challenge of coordination, besides the challenge of, the challenge of uh, strengthening the capacity of local and regional governments, there is also the challenge of the framework conditions. Good practices in budgeting, smart procurement and regulatory quality are integral or key to successful investment, but not always robust or consistent across levels of government. And if such critical preconditions are weak, efforts to strengthen coordination at, uh, and subnational governments' capacities may miss their targets. In order to address these sets of issues, the principles, the OECD principles, recommend governments to develop skills and adequate capacity, particularly and more than up to date at the subnational level through specialized procurement professionals and training programs, joint procurement mechanisms, and e procurement tools. Ladies and gentlemen, these principles, and I think some of you were present in Marseille, has be, have been discussed at our meeting, ministerial meeting, last December in Marseille, and are strongly supported both by the OECD ministers and by the representatives of local and regional authorities. And we are, of course, uh, particularly grateful for the support his work has received from the Committee of the Regions, which is advocating their endorsement at the EU level as one of the ways, as a way to improve the use, the effectiveness, the efficiency in the use of EU structural funds. I would really recommend to look very carefully, to have a careful look at these principles. And there is a convergence of views between the Committee and the of the Regions and the OECD concerning the multi-level governance approaches we've had, which have to be re-engineered sometimes and which will be central to the operation of the partnership contracts in the next programming period. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to hear that the Committee of the Regions supports the EU-wide adoption of these principles even beyond the domain of regional policy. This is of utmost importance. In practice, they are one of the first instruments which directly address the challenges and good practices associated with local and regional authorities. So to conclude, we welcome the proposal for collaboration as we prepare the toolkit for implementation in order to contribute to the dialogue and as a follow-up to the recent ministerial discussion in Marseille, we intend in the coming months to develop an international policy forum of subnational government representatives focusing on that very important uh, issue. But together today, um, we of course just incarnate this perspective and I very much welcome the following interventions and discussions to learn from your experiences, between uh, uh, your experiences in the field and your views in order to build together a better future for Europe, mostly because the difference between you and I today is that I, since a couple of years now, talk about how you design good policies and you do it on the field for which you deserve, of course, uh, a lot of respect. Thank you very much for your attention.